Okay, so welcome everybody to today's uh, Quasi World Seminar. Our first speaker today is Laura De Marco, and she will tell us about the geometry of the PCF locus. So please, Laura. All right, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm glad to join you. I wish I could <laughs> see some of you in person, but this will have to do. Um, so I want to talk about a project that I started working on more than 10 years ago, um, 12, 13 years ago. And I have to say that I personally have not made any progress on this project in the last 10 years, <laughs> roughly, more or less. But fortunately, a lot of other people have made progress on this project. And so what prompted me to talk about this, this time um, here today is was exactly that two months ago, and I saw that Jun Yixie is in our in our list of participants. Um, although now the list is getting long, I can't find him. But um, anyway, so so just two months ago, um, Jun Yi, together with Zhu Chao Ji, posted a preprint where they resolved a question that I had asked uh, some years ago, and I was very excited about it. And so I wanted to um, understand what they did. So I'm actually going to tell you give you a, something of a historical point of view. So where does the question come from? What is the question, first of all? Where does it come from? And a little bit about what they've done. And, and then if there's time, and the reason it says here, work in progress with Mirto Mavraki and Hashi Yi, is just thinking about what comes next. Uh, what, what, what do we wanna think about now? And, um, and one of the things we're thinking about, so I see, so since uh, Zhe Chang Li is also here, um, he will probably recognize one of the problems that appears at the very end, if I get to it, if I have time to talk about it. Um, so it's something I had also spoken to about with him 10 years ago. So anyways, um, let me get started. So geometry of the PCF locus. So what's the setting? The setting um, is the dynamics of rational maps. So uh, holomorphic maps from the Riemann sphere to itself. Um, and I'm interested specifically in the maps that are post-critically finite, uh, or PCF for short. Um, and so by definition, this just means that um, each of the critical points of the map F has a finite forward orbit. Okay? So is eventually periodic, is pre-periodic. Okay? So, so these maps, they they play a very special role in our study of dynamics on the Riemann sphere um, from, from, from many points of view, uh, maybe most fundamentally from our, in our efforts to classify all possible dynamical systems. Um, there, I mean, there are a lot of different things that one can say about these PCF maps, and I won't get into the full story there, but the, the, the aspect of them that I wanted to think about was sort of where are they or how do we find them? Um, how many are there? Um, what is their geometric configuration in the space of all maps? By the way, I have one example here that I put on the slide. So if you look at this particular quadratic polynomial, z squared minus one, remember it has two critical points because it's degree two, one at zero, one at infinity. It's a polynomial, so the critical point at infinity is fixed. So it has a finite orbit. And in this example, zero, the other critical point, is in a cycle of period two. So in this case, both of the critical points happen to be periodic, but post-critically finite, of course, just means that the, the orbits are finite. So they might they will eventually cycle. They're not necessarily in a cycle themselves. OK, so how do we find them? So what do I even mean by that? Um, let me just show you some pictures. Here are some pictures that I had generated also about 10 years ago when I was first talking about these projects. Um, so. Let's say take the case of quadratic polynomials. So this is the family z squared plus c. So this, this black region here is supposed to represent our parameter space. And I want to find some of the post-critically finite polynomials um, or maps. Bear in mind that, of course, to be post-critically finite is an algebraic condition. It's, it's a condition on the coefficients to be uh, post-critically finite. So, so of course, the critical points themselves are solutions to some polynomial equations that involve the coefficients of the maps. And so if you're looking in the space of all 
possible coefficients, the ones that have finite orbit uh, for their critical points are also some kinds of polynomial uh, conditions on the parameters. So in this very special case, suppose I want to impose the condition that zero is periodic. Well, we know, well, that we're just solving polynomial equations where C is my variable. So I just plotted out you know, a few of these examples, writing down what these polynomials are, and you just plot their solutions. And as n increases, here I'm just plotting more and more and more. And I think, at least with this audience, most of you know uh, what this is going to look like. As n increases, these yellow dots, which again correspond to the C values for which zero is periodic, are going to fill out the very famous picture of the Mandelbrot set. They're going to fill out and cluster everywhere on the boundary of the famous Mandelbrot set. Um, so when I ask, how do we find the post-critically finite maps? Well, in some sense, it's, I mean, we can just plot the picture and we see these fractal images of these bifurcation loci in various families. Um, of course, this particular family is very, very well studied, as, as you know. Um, and I listed just a couple facts about the post-critically finite maps in this family specifically. Um, so remember, of course, what is the Mendelbrot set by definition? It's just the C parameters for which the orbit of zero is bounded. To be post-critically finite would mean the orbit of zero is finite. So it's certainly contained in the Mendelbrot set. And here are some comments. Um, so I said these PCF maps are important from a classification point of view. So for example, here, we know that uh, at least the ones with periodic critical point, the yellow dots that I was actually drawing, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with our hyperbolic components inside the Mandelbrot set. And we can use the dynamics um, of these critical orbits and, and what we know about their Julia sets to classify the hyperbolic components, for example, by their Hubbard trees. Um, so the PCF maps encode for us a lot of information about the dynamics. Um, Another thing to mention is that, as I said, these yellow dots are accumulating everywhere on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. Um, in fact, uh, what we know is that they're even, it's not just that they accumulate as sets, but we know that they're uniformly distributed with respect to, in this case, the natural measure on the Mandelbrot set, which can be viewed as the harmonic measure as seen from infinity. Uh, for the boundary, which can be described as a certain bifurcation measure for this family of dynamical systems. Um, and so we can use them to, in some sense, detect bifurcations within families. Uh, okay, so that's the quadratic family. Let's see. So moving to the space of all maps, um, we might ask similar questions. So where are the post-critically finite maps in the moduli space of all maps? So here I've just given a quick definition. The MD is what I use to denote the moduli space. So the space of all rational functions of a given degree D, but modulo the obvious equivalence relation, conformal conjugacy, conjugacy by Mobius transformations. So two, you know, two rational maps to find the same dynamical system if they're conjugate by a Mobius transformation. Um, these spaces um, are not too complicated. They're always um, affine algebraic varieties. Uh, for example, in degree two, uh, Milner had computed that M2 is just uh, isomorphic to the affine plane, C2. Um, but we know more than that. They're all affine, as I said, in degree D. In fact, we can think of them as algebraic varieties defined over Q over the field of rational numbers. Um, but they're not smooth in general. This one is lucky in degree two. It's, as I said, it's just a copy of C2 um, with some very natural choices of coordinates that you can read about in this article of Milner. Um, in general, they'll have singularity. So MD will be singular for higher degrees D. And we understand roughly some of the structure. We know what this, where these spaces have singularities. It corresponds to maps with automorphisms. Um, there's a lot one can say, but it is still somewhat mysterious, I should say, what, what really the structure of these spaces are. We do not have a complete description of exactly which varieties we've, we've, we've got. Um, but nevertheless, we can still think of them as you know, just spaces of maps. I mean, if you don't do modulo conjugation, but you just work with the space of rational functions themselves, the coefficients, then you know, some concrete space to work with. Um, 
corresponding to some of the statements I mentioned about the quadratic polynomials, I just wanted to add, in general, there, the PCF maps uh, consist of, well, a certain countable collection in every degree, together with uh, the flexible Lattes family. So the, there's at most a, a a one parameter family of maps of a given degree, the degree has to be a square that would come from um, endomorphisms of an elliptic curve. Well, I guess there are really two families in each of those degrees, but anyways, there, there are just some curves that might correspond to the maps coming from, from dynamics on tori that descend down to the Riemann sphere. But otherwise, except for those, those special families of maps, you have some countable collection of post-critically finite maps in each in each degree. And I, I emphasize that actually that countable set of points um, can then be viewed as algebraic points inside these affine varieties. Um, because remember, I said that you know, post-critically finite maps are defined by certain algebraic polynomial equations, right? The critical point which you, know, you can express in terms of the coefficients, and then it has to satisfy a dynamical orbit relation, it has to circle back to itself. So these conditions impose you know, equations in the coefficients that are themselves defined over Q, actually. And so the collection of all of those roots has to be, have to be algebraic. So, um, and by Thurston rigidity, we know they're single points except for these uh, exceptions. Um, but there are lots of them. So there's, as I said, a countable set, for each degree, except for that exception, but but really there are lots of them, and they're spread out throughout the space. And I've written that here to emphasize that this set, this PCF set, is Zariski dense in the space of all all rational maps in every degree d. Um, okay, by definition, of course, that just means they're not contained in some proper algebraic subvariety. They really are spread out in some sense. And there are a lot of different ways that one can prove that. We can use uh, the J stability theory to prove that, building on some earlier results from the 80s. Or we can use some modern methods to say, well, just as in, let me just go back to the previous slide for a second, just as in the case of quadratic polynomials, we know that they can be found everywhere dense in the boundary of the Mendelbrot set. The same kind of statement is true in, uh, in all degrees in the space of all maps. There's some natural measure on this space, and it turns out they're dense in the support of that measure. In, there, in fact, now we even know that they're uniformly distributed, but I won't have time to talk about that um, <clears throat> as some, a consequence of some recent uh, arithmetic results. OK, so here's the question that I'd been thinking about for, for many years. This is a version of the question, shall we say. These points I just said are Zariski dense. They're sort of scattered around the whole space. But where are they in the space? Where are they? And so one can make that a precise question by asking which, for example, which algebraic curves in this variety, in this space MD, can possibly pass through infinitely many of these PCF maps? Okay. Or more generally, which algebraic subvarieties? Can contain a Zariski dense set of these special points. So that's the question. Um, and it's a question I've been thinking about, and, and but I'm not the only one. I mean, there's a, a long history of questions of this flavor that are really in, inspired by, uh, or you know, that, that exist already in, in complex geometry and in arithmetic geometry in many different settings. Um, this particular question, um, as I said, was inspired by some results some famous conjectures, later theorems, such as what are called the Manin Mumford and the Andre Ord conjecture. Now these are theorems, but um, so there's just a whole um, host of questions of this flavor. You have some ambient variety, you have some distinguished special points in your variety, and you under want to understand if some subvariety passes through lots and lots of those special points, then that subvariety must be special itself. Okay, so that's the, 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 the sort of conjectural answer, whatever that should mean. Let me try to make this slightly more precise, although still very vague. So one more time. So, that, so this conjectural answer to this question is that an algebraic curve uh, or a subvariety in general can only contain lots and lots of these special points if the, if the variety itself is special. Okay, a subvariety of MD would have a Zariski dense set of special points if and only if 
the subvariety is special. And what do we mean by special here? Well, the points themselves, post-critically finite, are defined by critical orbit relations. As I said, every critical point has a finite uh, orbit. The special variety should then be the ones which are also defined by critical orbit relations, that maybe two critical points collide or one critical point has a finite orbit persistently throughout the variety. So it's, it's one implication of the conjecture is fairly easy. If you know that your curve or your subvariety is defined by these critical orbit relations, then it's more or less a dimension count that, that if, if it's defined itself by these relations, then you'll always have lots and lots of post-critically finite maps for dimension count reasons. It's fundamentally a dimension issue. Remember that this dimension of this space is 2D minus two complex dimension, which is the same as the number of critical points. That's also 2D minus two. So if you're imposing 2D minus two conditions, you expect to get down to points. And that was, that's the truth as a consequence of Thurston rigidity, except for those Flatez examples. But, and then as similarly, if your variety is defined by some of those 2D minus two conditions, and then you impose the rest of them, you expect to have all the possible solutions just by varying N and M. So one implication is more or less a dimension count, although there's something to show, but um, it's the converse implication, which is hard. The converse implication is hard. If you have, so the converse implication is the following. If you have lots and lots of PCF points, can you conclude that the subvariety itself had to have been special? Okay, and here, dramatically, is the main theorem of this preprint that was just posted a couple months ago by Ji and Xie. And the title of their preprint is Dao for Curves. Um, and I, I mentioned because some people called this conjecture uh, the dynamical Andre Ort conjecture, inspired by the Andre Ort conjecture about Shimura varieties. Um, anyways, Dao is short for dy dynamical Andre Ort, but also has some other meaning, which is fun. So in any case, the theorem is that they were able to prove that this is true, that this conjecture actually holds for algebraic curves in MD. Okay, again, that is to say, a given algebraic curve in the moduli space MD will contain infinitely many post-critically finite maps, if and only if it is special, meaning that it's defined by critical orbit relations. I have to pause here for one moment. I didn't actually give you a definition of special. This is just a, an approximate definition of special. I said critical orbit relations are essentially equations where you say label two of your critical points and you force, they could be the same critical point. You label two critical points, maybe the same, maybe not, and you force their orbits to collide. Um, there are other relations that can arise and I'll give you a more formal definition a little bit later. I just want you to appreciate at least the statement before I get uh, technical about what other conditions uh, we have to consider. Um, anyways, so, so I should mention, of course, you know, this conjecture didn't come out of out of nowhere, as I said, okay, it has some history and context related to other subjects. But even um, in the dynamical context, in this context, um, Matt Baker and I were able to show some special cases. We were mostly working with polynomial maps. Um, and then there were a number of other people who had worked out special cases before this full uh, resolution for algebraic curves for rational maps um, appeared. And one significant breakthrough I want to mention um, was due to Charles Favre and Thomas Gauthier. Um, I think it was a 2020 preprint. It's now um, appears as a it's written up as one of the, the orange books, the, the Princeton Annals of Math series books. Um, where they give the full uh, details of a proof of this theorem for polynomials. So in the case of polynomials, this was known. So again, we're looking today just in the space of degree D polynomials and algebraic curves in that space. Um, there it was already known. And of course, as, as many of you know, working with the dynamics of polynomials can be quite different than working with the dynamics of, of rational maps uh, more generally. With polynomials, we have a lot of extra machinery, as you perhaps know. I mean, out near infinity, we have what we call the butcher coordinates, and we have these escape rate functions, these green functions, and they give us 
tools with which we can go from infinity back down to the Julia set and use those tools to analyze the dynamics of the points in the Phil Julia set. So um, anyway, so, the, so there are a lot of, there's a, a lot of extra uh, complex analysis that can be used. Things are a little bit different in the case of polynomials. And so there really had to be some new ideas to treat, uh, to treat the rational maps. I will mention also that the higher dimensional subvariety setting is still wide open. Um, but now that we know it for curves, I, I mean, I feel to me, it feels like, okay, it's got to obviously be true in higher dimensions too. But for the moment, we don't have all of the all of the tools in place to answer that question. All right, so that's the theorem. Um, I want I mentioned special cases. I want now to focus on a special case to try to make this explicit. And I want to say a few words about what goes into the proofs of statements of this flavor, uh, because I said the question was inspired by questions in arithmetic geometry. In fact, the proofs are also inspired by, by results in arithmetic geometry. And, the, and what I found particularly interesting about these questions was the, the combination of methods, of using methods from arithmetic geometry and combining them with the methods that many of you might be more familiar with from complex dynamics and, um, and complex analysis and trying to, to combine the methods to be able to answer questions of this sort. And, and in every one of these cases that were known and in the new proof, it really and truly is a combination of arithmetic and complex tools. We, I don't know how to treat any cases using only arithmetic or using only complex analytic. Uh, tools. Okay. So here's a special case that I want to focus on for a few minutes. What time is it? Okay, 22 after. All right, so I want to spend some time on this special case. So this is um, a special case that I that I worked on also around uh, 10 years ago. Um, and it was, let's just focus on degree two. Okay, so I'm assuming that my maps have degree two. And within this moduli space, there are lots of distinguished algebraic curves that have some dynamical meaning uh, that we might want to we might want to look at. And I was looking at the this family of curves that Milner calls peer one lambda. So what are these curves? So you fix a complex number lambda and you look at the set of all maps that have a fixed point of multiplier lambda. The set of all degree two maps that have a fixed point of multiplier lambda. So lambda is fixed. Okay, so I wrote it here, f and m2, for which there exists a point which is fixed by f at which the derivative is lambda. Okay, so these are what Milner called the pure one lambda curves. Now I want to point out that, and maybe I, I shouldn't have stated this quite so quickly, but certainly when lambda is zero, when lambda is zero, notice what that means. When lambda is zero, that means there's a fixed point at which the derivative is zero. So that is a special condition. Okay, that is a condition on a critical point. To say the derivative is zero means it's a critical point. So it's saying one critical point is fixed. Okay, so that's why this is automatically a special curve. And in fact, we know which curve it is. In fact, we've already seen it. Here's a picture of it. The lambda equals zero case is precisely the family of quadratic polynomials. Pier one zero is the family of quad, oops, went the wrong way. There we go. Pier one zero is the, the family of quadratic polynomials. So it is special. And as we know, it already has lots and lots of post-critically finite maps. I drew them in yellow. You've seen the picture already. Okay. Pier one zero is special. Now, the others, just to say that you have a multiplier five, you have a fixed point of multiplier five, for example, might be special, might be not. A priori, we don't really know if there are some hidden special curves in this family. We defined them by a multiplier condition. But a priori, they could also be defined by a critical orbit relation condition. So I wrote here only pure one zero is special. But that wasn't that's not totally obvious without, without studying them more carefully. So the theorem in this case is that it's true that really and truly pure one zero is the only special curve. And not only that, every non-special curve contained only finitely many post-critically finite maps. Okay. So all right, so again, so this, as I said, was a special case of the conjecture. The curve Pier 1 lambda contains infinitely many post-critically finite maps 
if and only if lambda is zero. Um, and just to have a sense of the geometry that just wanted to draw, hmm, does my pencil work here? Let's see, hold on. Okay, imagine that this box is our, our affine plane. Remember M2 is just a copy of C2. It's just a two dimensional complex manifold. Now these pier one lambdas in Milner's coordinates on M2, these pier one lambdas are lines. So they're really just, a, this is just a family of straight lines. Now these lines necessarily intersect each other because of course a given map has three fixed points and those three fixed points might be three different multipliers. And so a given map might sit on the intersection of three lines. But of course, every map has some fixed points and some multipliers. So, so I want you to realize that this pier one lambda is a family of lines, a pencil of lines, which is sweeping out the entire M2. So this family of lines covers all of M2. And there was something surprising about this statement when we first started thinking of it, because, um, because you know, we know that pier one zero, oh, what happened to my picture? That's weird. Oh, I clicked done and then it disappeared. I didn't, sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> anyways. Okay, so you have this family of lines sweeping out. I was gonna draw more, but forget it. Um, uh, so we know that this one, one line has infinitely many post-critically finite maps on it. And these maps are Zariski dense, so they're not contained in only finitely many lines or anything like that. So the, the map, the points themselves are Zariski dense, only one line contains infinitely many, but all the others have only finitely many. So this was, it's just conceptually something of a surprise that the way the points are configured is that although there are lots of them, they really are spread out with respect to this pencil of lines. They're really scattered about. There's one line that has tons of them, infinitely many. Every other one has only finitely many. And in fact, many lines have none at all, right? Certainly if lambda, remember that if lambda, maybe I can write something. Oh, oh, I came back, great. Okay, so, so notice that if lambda, if lambda is say less than or equal to one, so if you have a multiplier, which is if their point is attracting or indifferent, then there are no PCF points at all. So this implies that PCF intersect here one lambda, sorry, bigger than zero, uh, is empty. There are no post-critically finite maps at all on those. So again, we have this family of lines, tons of them at zero, none at all for lambda and the unit disk and the closed unit disk. And then all the others are scattered about as much as possible. So the geometry is surprising. From, from my point of view, this was a surprise, even though it fit the conjecture. I mean, I conjectured it. I thought it would be true, but yet at the same time, it surprised me. So I just want to put this simple, it's now I think of it as a simple statement in context. Um, all right. So this is the theorem. I, I, maybe I should, are there any questions at this point? Sorry, I should stop for a moment just in case about the statements or anything else. I want to show some pictures. No. Okay, so I want to just take a look at uh, at uh, here. Let me click done. There we go. Okay, my picture's vanished, but at least you can see the statement again. Just to get a sense of what these pier one lambda curves even look like, I said they're lines, and and so as a consequence, we can draw as I did here, uh, you know, a picture of the bifurcation locus in each of these families, and then you'll see like why some of them have post-critically finite maps and why some of them don't. Um, this is a picture when lambda is in the unit disk. Um, so, and what you see here are two copies of the Mendelbrot set. So this is a picture of the bifurcation locus inside this pier one lambda curve. I've parameterized it in the following way. I've just chosen a parameterization of this, of this curve. In fact, it's a double cover of the curve, strictly speaking, um, because in the C is my parameter and C and minus C turn out to be con conjugate, um, but which explains why you have a double cover. But uh, it, the helpful thing about working in this way is that really what you're seeing is the bifurcation locus for the two different critical points. Remember, there are two critical points for this map. And each one of them is independently being iterated about. So for some parameters, one of the critical points hits the Julia set. And for the other parameter, for other parameters, the other critical point hits the Julia set. Um, 
but there always has to be some critical point going to the attracting cycle at zero. So that's why these two Mandelbrot sets are, are, are disjoint from each other. Um, and in fact, I, I, you can plot independently. So I drew the bifurcation for one critical point. Again, so I'm plotting when does one of the critical points um, get tangled up in the Julia set of the map versus when does the other critical point get tangled up in the Julia set of the map. And that's what these things are plotting. And then the union of those things is exactly what we call the bifurcation locus for this family. But again, because these are separate, since one critical point must always go to the attracting cycle, it'll have an infinite orbit. And so there cannot be any post-critically finite maps. There are no post-critically finite maps here at all. Um, by contrast, if you take a parameter bigger than one in absolute value, um, maybe there are post-critically finite maps, or maybe not. I don't actually know in this particular example. I didn't try to compute any, but the pictures become quite spectacular. So you again, you have two critical points. So this is really two pictures, one superimposed upon the other, where you have one of the critical points bifurcating, going through the Julia set, versus the other critical point bifurcating, going through the Julia set. Um, creating bifurcations in the family. So it's bifurcation in a true dynamical sense, um, violating stability in this family. And then the union of those two things is precisely when the family fails to be stable in the structural stability sense, uh, J structural stability sense. Okay, so this is a picture just for 1.1, but maybe there are post-critically finite maps where these sets overlap. There might very well be some in these little eyes here in the center of the picture. Um, here's another example where actually the two bifurcation sets for the two critical points um, have lots of overlap. Here's the picture for one critical point. Here's the picture for the other critical point. And you can see there's tons of overlap, but they're not exactly the same. You see these little decorations here on one side or the other. Let me just go back. You don't see them for both. I have the decoration here, but I don't have it on the other side. But when you see the union, of course, you see it, it becomes a symmetric picture. Um, so they're not the same bifurcation sets, but they're, they're close. Um, but here's, okay, so here's what, what's actually being proved in, in this special case, okay? So this is just an idea of the proof of this conjecture in this very special case, this particular family of curves. So again, the statement was that the curve pure one lambda which can be parametrized by this family of maps, contains infinitely many post-critically finite maps if and only if lambda is zero. All right, so, so what do you do? You look at those two critical points. Okay, by the way, this doesn't make sense if lambda is zero. Of course, I'm only using this parameterization when lambda is non-zero. And we know the lambda equals zero case is the polynomial, so I don't, I'm not gonna worry about the lambda zero case. I'll take lambda not zero. If there are, okay, so step one is to say, if there are infinitely many post-critically finite maps, then those two critical points have to actually behave the same. It turns out they have to behave the same. Those two different pictures that I drew in blue and red have to be the same picture. And not only are they same picture, but the measures they determine, how they pass through those Julia sets turns out to also have to be the same. There's a way to quantify how those critical points are passing through the Julia set. And I call that the bifurcation measure, and it turns out that they have to be the same. Um, why do they have to be the same? This, this is where the arithmetic comes in, okay? This is where the arithmetic comes in. Notice, um, here's what I wanna say. In, just as on a, on a Julia set, okay, let's suppose I'm in a dynamical context and I, I'm on a Julia set. The, if you take, all of the periodic points on the Julia set, we know that the, all of the periodic points, if you order them by period, become uniformly distributed with respect to the maximal measure, the measure of maximal entropy. But if you took just some infinite sequence of periodic points without any care, just I'm gonna choose an infinite sequence of periodic points, they might just be clustered in some corner of the Julia set and they wouldn't necessarily be uniformly distributed. Same thing here. If I had just taken some collection of points where the where the critical points become periodic, each individual period critical point becomes periodic, they may not be spread around the entire space. But the set of PCF maps where both of the critical points become pre-periodic 
is Galois invariant. This is the key, this is the key observation to, to, to explain like where the algebra is coming in. That this set of points that I'm looking at, this infinitely many PCF points, both of the critical points have to have a finite orbit. Um, and that set of maps is invariant under the Galois action. You have a, a lambda to have any PCF maps at all has to be algebraic, which we already knew by Thurston rigidity. So it's defined over some number field. And then this set of PCF maps has to be invariant under the Galois Q bar over K or K bar over K, whatever the field is that lambda lives in. And that Galois invariance buys you a lot. As in the Julia set case, if your collection of periodic points were Galois invariant for the field over which your map is defined, then it forces those points, the, the, the orbits themselves to be uniformly distributed. So the Galois invariance buys you a lot. And this is one of the key uh, inputs of, of the arithmetic, uh, the algebraic tools. This is where we're using the algebra. It's not just any old collection of points where one or the other critical point has finite orbit, but it's a Galois invariant set. And if that's infinite, then it turns out by height theory, one can prove that those, those PCF points have to be uniformly distributed with respect to two a priori different measures for the two different critical points. Um, and I have to say that in our proof of this special case, a good amount of work went into showing that the hypotheses of these theorems were satisfied. Um, now things are a little different. So when I say a word about the GCA proof, it's a, the, the emphasis is in a different place. But at the time, um, it wasn't completely obvious how to apply these theorems. And so we spent some time like doing a bunch of computations and, and showing that actually we could apply these uh, Galois, this, these statements about the Galois orbits of these points. So this is where the algebra came in. But after the algebra, then it became rather straightforward. Because once I had that these two measures were the same, so again, going back, if I were to have infinitely many post-critically finite maps, it would tell me that the distribution on the red set is equal to the distribution on the, on the blue set. But the blue set and the red set are not the same in this picture. As you can see, I said there were decorations. So those measures can't be the same. And you could use dynamics to show it. So step two is fairly straightforward. And I'm not going to give details, but in this audience, because you're more of a complex audience, um, Anyways, it's, it's just some potential theory. We were explicitly computing potentials for the measures that you get and showing that the potentials aren't the same, therefore the measures aren't the same. So what we, you know, one of the things we actually prove in this special family was that the bifurcation measures in this family for the two different critical points at, in each slice, they had to be different. Um, and that's what we had proved in this family. Okay, now I wanna say a few words. Oh no, I forgot. I was going to show you a couple more pictures. OK, I said that in the previous pictures, those two sets, the red set and the blue set, they're not the same. So of course, the measures can't be the same. The support of the measure is equal to that black bifurcation locus. Um, in practice, however, the set is very hard to study. We really do work with the measures and not with the sets. And in this picture, I just want to say there were, and this was a picture I generated I don't know, in 2012 or something. And I was playing around with these examples and I was really surprised to find that when lambda's negative four, so I look in this family of maps, parametrized, this is the C plane, remember. When lambda's negative four, the blue critical point and the red critical point generate what looked like nearly identical sets. And, and at this scale, they really are identical. I don't, I don't think that you can actually see a difference except for numerical error between the blue set and the red set at this scale. Um, and so it really required for this family studying the measures. So this is a plot, which is the blue or the red, one of the critical points and its distribution versus the other critical point and its distribution. And it turned out the measures are actually very different, despite the fact that the sets looked very much the same. So I just want to emphasize that um, the methods that went into this really were, were, were you know, studying the measures. Um, and for me, that was a really interesting part. And since I mentioned Zhi Chang Li, who's here, um, he might recall that uh, in 2013, in the summer of 2013, we were studying these 
these measures and sort of try, oh, he's there, here we are. And we were trying to understand features of these measures and, and uh, anyways, questions related to the post-critically finite maps and, and studying stuff. So he might recall that we never, <laughs> so anyways, there were some questions that we thought about back then that turned out to be really hard and we never resolved them. But uh, anyhow, here we are today. So, um, okay, so I wanted to compare this outline of the proof to what G and Xie do now in this general case. So I, I don't have tons of time, but let me just say a few words because the proofs are, are on a, like if you step way back and look at the proof, it kind of looks the same, but all of the details turn out to be different. Um, and it's a really beautiful idea, especially going into step two. Okay, so remember what they proved. They proved that now if you take any algebraic curve, C in the moduli space of maps of degree D, It'll have infinitely many post-critically finite maps, if and only if it's special, by which I mean any pair of active critical points, the ones that are bifurcating, the ones that are not persistently pre-periodic. So any critical point that's not just pre-periodic for the entire family must be dynamically related. And here is an actual definition of dynamical relation. It means that in the family, you can find you think of the F of, let's say F is the map. You, you, you consider F F as a dynamical system on P1 cross P1. And we look for invariant curves. For example, the diagonal would be an invariant curve in P1 cross P1, or the graph of F would be an invariant curve in P1 cross P1. But there are lots of others that might come from symmetries of F or, Anyways, other, other types of, of, of weird things, decomposition relations that could occur for F. We say that the critical points are related if they happen to lie in one of these invariant curves, possibly reducible invariant curves. Okay, So the actual definition of critically related or critical point relation has to be written in this more general way, because I just want to say we do not have a complete classification of what those are. For rational maps. For polynomials, there is a complete description of these, of what these relations can be. For rational maps, that's still open, although there's been a lot of work. So we give, I'm giving a very general definition of what it means to be related. Okay, fine. That hopefully at least you can understand their statement. Uh, the curve has infinitely many PCF points, if and only if any pair of bifurcating critical points, active critical points, uh, is related. Um, and so in some sense, step one is the same, um, or the way I think of step one of the proof, that if there are infinitely many post-critically finite maps, then each of the active critical points um, where it becomes pre-periodic has to be uniformly distributed with respect to some measure. But if they're simultaneously pre-periodic at some Galois invariant set, then necessarily they're all defining the same measures, okay? So the step one is the sort of the same kind of uh, theorem, which is that each of the critical points must determine the same bifurcation measure. So you have just one picture, a red picture, a blue picture, even a green picture, even a purple picture, you know, if you have 15 critical points, but they're all determining the same bifurcation set. Um, Nowadays, I should say that uh, we have. There's been a lot of development in our, on the arithmetic side, as well as development on the complex side, um, in the last ten years. And now we have some very powerful equidistribution tools that we can use. And G and Xie rely on a recent preprint of Xin Yi Yuan and Shou Wu Zhang um, that studies height functions on affine varieties, not just projective varieties. There's, that's the key difference here. Um, and these are, remember, algebraic curves in an affine variety. So they are themselves affine. And so previously, the equidistribution results required working on projective spaces, so compact manifolds. Here, we don't have that. So anyway, so this was a, this was a, this is really nice that we have this extra tool. So that made this step of the proof <clears throat> easier. But the second step, which is the main part of their proof, is much, much harder. We, in our case, we could just do a computation. Now, we need to somehow say, just because those measures are the same, can we conclude that the points are related? And actually, we cannot quite. 
we can't say just because the measures are the same, the dynamics are related. So what they do is they say, ah, let's do a whole bunch of complicated complex dynamics and use more of the machinery from the algebraic side to conclude that there's a dynamical relation. So what they're doing is they have this really uh, beautiful idea to say, and I'm going to say this in one sentence, and it doesn't nearly do it justice. And I apologize to Junyi. I don't know if she chose in the audience too, but here's the here's the sort of the underlying idea. Typical. So in this family, the the maps that are the the Cole Ekman maps, the Cole Ekman maps, for which are maps for which you have expansion along critical orbits. These are typical for these families with respect to these bifurcation measures. And so what they're able to, to do is to say, well, we know the different critical points determine the same bifurcation measure. When you have expansion, such as you do for the Cole ekman maps, you can compare the bifurcation, the parameter space picture, the bifurcation measure to the dynamical space measure. So there's a transport of information as always in complex dynamics from the parameter space to the dynamical space. And having the same bifurcation measures tells you that there's some connection between the dynamical measures, the Julia sets near each of those critical points. So they use these expansive properties of these typical type maps to transport the bifurcation measure to a dynamical statement. And then we can study dynamical symmetry. So then it becomes a statement about, oh, well, all these maps have some kind of symmetries of their Julia sets. Well, going back to the early 90s, we know how to study symmetries of Julia sets. And then we can build up uh, to some recent works to really try to extract relations between the critical orbits. Um, and so this uh, really doesn't do much justice to their proof, but, but, it's, but their proof at a sort of stepping back is, is, a, is, a, is an argument by, by contradiction. Because of the Cole Ekman type maps, the complex analysis tells you that your critical orbits have to be very close, if not in, some invariant curve, some kind of relation. So the complex stuff pushes the critical orbits to be very, very close to some invariant curve, possibly inside. But the arithmetic argument says, oh, kind of like a Diophantine condition. We can't get too close to an invariant curve unless we're actually in it. So the, the arithmetic input says we can't actually get too close unless the orbits are actually in the relation. And that's how they deduce ultimately that there's a relation. So it's something, you know, I think in my mind of this as a type of Diophantine type condition, the complex dynamics gets you really close to a, in a relation. The arithmetic puts you in the relation. Um, so that is a, sort of a a summary. I'm going to have to finish because I see that it's 1148. So I guess I have two minutes. Um, I wanted to say, so just to compare, as I said, so I said, well, what's next? I haven't talked at all about my ongoing work or my new project or anything else. Um, but I do want to say that, and I've really emphasized this part of the two different proofs, because it's something I find very interesting is we extract from step one, again, that these measures for two different critical points, we get these bifurcation measures are the same. But to get the relation from that, to get the relation, we have to go back to the arithmetic and combine it with the complex dynamics. And so it leaves the question, sort of the obvious question from my point of view, is if you just take any old algebraic curve defined over the field of complex numbers in the moduli space, if you assume that you have two critical points, that are bifurcating the same. So they look like they're related. The pictures are the same, the measures are the same. Can you conclude that they're actually related? Can you extract an algebraic relation between the orbit of C1 and the orbit of C2? And as I said, that was the strategy we used both for the family of curves Pier 1 lambda and in some other examples for polynomials when I was first starting to look at this. Uh, but we don't actually know how to do that in general. Um, and so I want to finish in the very last 30 seconds or so by saying this is the ongoing work in progress that Mirto and Hashi and I have been thinking about, inspired by the G Xie result. We were inspired as soon as we saw that they've resolved Dao for curves. We wondered if uniform Dao might hold. 
which is the statement that, well, you have a family of curves like pier one lambda. We know that on all of those curves, at least when lambda is non-zero, there are only finitely many post-critically finite, post-critically finite points on each one. Is it possible that there's a uniform bound? So we have these PCF maps just scattered about as much as can be on this family of curves. And what we've managed to prove and what we actually knew already for this special example is that yes, there turns out it's not just finite on each of these curves, but there's actually a uniform bound in this family. And if we had what I like to think of as measure DAO, which is this open question that I've written here and that I'm thinking about, um, what we now believe is that measure DAO implies uniform DAO, but maybe DAO itself implies uniform DAO. And it's just kind of fun to think about the logic of all these different problems. Um, so we know now we have a uniform bounds um, here, which is exactly the opposite of what I thought would be true 10 years ago. I was sure there would be no uniform bound. So, okay, I should stop there. It's 11.50. That's it. Okay, so let's uh, thank uh, Laura. And let me open the discussion. So are there any uh, comments or questions? Uh, Dylan. Yeah, Dylan. Uh, Dylan, you had your hand raised. Uh, sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. yes. OK, yes, you said there was a uniform bound for pure one lambda. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. You don't I have really, any. Um, you know, my guess would be two. <laughs> OK, <laughs> no, but I, I genuinely don't know. I, I mean, I do have some guesses, but I, I, I not that I'm going to boldly say we've just started working on this project. What we know right now is that there is a uniform bound and it's it's surprising because I would have thought those examples where those those bifurcation loci seem to line up, like at lambda equals minus four, that the, maybe the reason um, maybe the reason is that it's because there are lots and lots of postcritically finite maps at certain parameters. But it turns out I was wrong, and and you know I might very well be <laughs> wrong again. But right now I'm convinced that indeed there, there's a proof that there is a uniform bound in this case. Um, I had another question. So for the curves, like all pairs of points had to be uh, related, right? But that's special to, to curves. Is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. So the statement is that any pair of active critical points will be be related. That's the content of this theorem. Yes. That's but, right. but the corresponding statement wouldn't be true. Oh, no, no, sorry. So in higher dimensions, OK, so in higher dimensions, yeah, you don't expect every single pair, but it would still be in pairs. So, so what one can show, um, oh, can one show this? So yeah, I'm pretty sure, yes, that, that what is known is that, that any relation that's going to exist will happen in pairs. Um, that it's not that like three orbit, they're gonna have some weird polynomial relation that's gonna involve three critical points. Um, it's always in pairs. And there, it's just a matter of how many of the pairs because the number of free critical points should correspond to the dimension of the, of the variety. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this the statement about it always coming in pairs. Um, well, I remember first learning about it from the logicians, the, the people in model theory who who worked out this this an argument like this in the dynamical context. And Alice Medvedev's thesis uh, is where I, I first learned about this. How it how they have to come in pairs as opposed to having uh, triples of points with complicated relations. So. Are there other comments or questions? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. So let's uh, thank uh, Laura again. All right, thank you.